38 last night. They'll be good for a beach. Okay, I'm gonna go brush my teeth. Do you want to put anything in the sink or? I can't see what I'm doing, but I'm gonna. Oh, I can see you now a little bit. is on. There we go. Now I can see you. Hi, good morning. Where are we at? on that box up there. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> She's going to make a production out of it. Okay.
He's dying.
big one. Spectacular view that we're getting this morning. You only can see the top of this mountain like 30, 40 times out of the whole year. And we're looking at it right now. Out on this mountain, Mount Waiale Ale, a rainiest place in the world. Alright, and the reason that she's so rainy 
is all due to uh, starts with the trade winds. All right, we get the trade winds typically blowing from the northeast to the southwest. Not, uh, today. not today though. The next few days, however, we're gonna have the Kona winds. That's where they're coming in from the southern side of the island. So it's bringing in all that volcanic gas and dust and stuff like that from the Big Island. Um, so a little bit different cloud formation throughout the island for the next uh, few days out here. Um, but typically though, those warm trade winds off the ocean will get flown in along the mountain ranges over here. This one off to the right is called Makaleha. See it over there kind of near Kapa'a and um, Wailua area. And then this big mountain in front, Waiale Ale. And all that trade winds get flown in along right in front of Makaleha Mountain, right into the mouth of the crater. You can see off to about two o'clock, there's a big opening in this mountain face, allowing us to see right into the back wall of this crater. And that's because it's missing the eastern side. Uh, the eastern wall was blown out about five and a half million years ago in the primary eruption that created this side of the island. And if a different wall had gotten blown out, it wouldn't have the rainiest place in the world. But since it's missing that eastern wall, like I said, it's able to catch those trades that we get most of the time coming out of here. And then when all that warm air hits the back wall, it rises up to the top. Now the cool thing about that is these trade winds, usually all that moisture will dissipate once it reaches 6,000 feet. It'll all dry up out of those clouds. Um, but this mountain peaks out at 5,243 feet. So just shy of a mile. And since it's under 6,000 feet, all that moisture is retained inside these clouds, mixing with the cold air up on top of this mountain. Uh, and that's what produces all the rainfall, condensation, and moisture up there. It's a process known as orographic uplift. I know, right? <laughs> My Snapple Technical. fact last night. I wanted Technical. to use it today. And then up on top of the mountain, it doesn't quite drop over top of it. You can go hike out over top of the swamp. Right, Very, very beautiful. See, there's about 200 different plants, animals, and insects only found in that swamp. Nowhere else in the world. Uh, researchers say if you go up there, that's what Hawaii would waterfall. You can see it. 12 o'clock. White line about halfway up the mountain. works. Uh, but that waterfall never dries up. That's the only one on this whole mountain range. It's stream down here to the bottom left. It's called the Vaiahi Stream. That's the south fork of the Wailua River. All right, and then before it meets up with the river though, we pull a portion of it into our ditch. So there is a visual map as to where your tubing water is coming from today. That big waterfall straight in front of a 3,500 foot three-tier waterfall is your tubing water for today. And so it's all fresh Hawaii rainfall. All right, it takes no more than 24 hours for the water to get from the top of the mountain into our ditch. Very, very fresh, clear, clean rainwater. Uh, now, guys may be curious about the temperature of this water that we're gonna be in today. You gotta do the reverse, life changing to octave changing. Whatever descriptions you guys like, use them. Just omit the C and F words out of your vocabulary. All right. <laughs> down the We're in the rainforest. Looks
Did you notice this big tree here? Oh, wow. Look at that thing. That is giant. <laughs> Tree. Yeah. Okay. She doesn't really like football. What? I don't like football. I know. I can't follow this stuff. Is there a McDonald's? How about that? It's over 24 hours. No, they took it. Okay. Yeah, they're on the site. That's what I grabbed. Yeah, you can sing too. Yeah. Alright guys, about that time. Oh, you take pictures? Whatever. Couple more water here. Water's guys.
action. Buoyancy on this side, and very rear of the ship with the stern, with the buoyancy just behind us there. 
from bow to stern to USS Arizona was 608 feet long. She was 106 feet wide at the beam, or at its widest point. So again, a very large, very impressive ship. Now a lot of times what folks don't realize, what doesn't get talked about though, is the role of the ship itself. Uh, and I'll go into that in just a moment. Now the reason why this ship is memorialized here, again, as you saw in the film, as you have now clearly seen in the grinder, this ship would suffer more loss than any other ship the Navy had in any other battle they ever fought in. But a lot of times what folks don't realize, and what I was mentioning before, the Arizona, the ship itself, she will play an absolutely vital role in World War II. And what that role was and where this comes in is how we responded to the attack here at Pearl Harbor. You see, ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest mistakes the Japanese made that morning, they damaged but did not destroy our dry dock facilities right here in Pearl Harbor. This gave us the ability right here to begin to repair these ships and in many cases send them directly out to fight, much faster than Japan had ever anticipated. What we didn't have, however, and what Hawaii is in very short supply of, were the materials necessary to make those repairs. That is where ships like the Arizona would become absolutely vital. They knew this ship was so badly damaged she was never going back out to sea, so they would salvage from this ship anything that they could use to further those repairs. But folks, there's another story, another question we get asked every day, <coughs> excuse me, and this story comes about when you hear that number of over 950 men on board this ship. The question is always, why did they leave so many men? Why did they not try to recover those men? The fact is, they did recover men from this ship. 107 men were actually recovered from this ship, positively identified, and returned to their families to be laid to rest. Approximately 235 more men were removed, but unfortunately these men were not able to be identified. Those men were then taken to Punchbowl National Cemetery and laid to rest basically in tombs of the unknown. Those men were given a very special honor, the same honor given to the over 950 that would remain on board this ship. For those men laid to rest at Punchbowl, they are considered buried at sea and are still considered to be crew members aboard their ship here. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is why they left those 950 men on board. As they removed those 235, it became very apparent. First and foremost, given the technology at the time, by the time they got to these men, they were not going to be able to identify them. And second, just how many men this ship had lost. Almost her entire crew was still on board. That being the case, they make the decision to stop removing anyone else from this ship and to leave these men together where they had fallen as a crew aboard their ship. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why over 950 men are still on board their ship here. Now, after this, they would salvage from this ship. And basically, battleships are large gun platforms. So this became top priority to remove from this ship. All of her five-inch guns would be taken off, either placed onto other ships and sent back out, some used here on Oahu. Three of her four sets of turrets would also be taken off of this ship. The guns of turret number two would be taken off and placed onto the USS Nevada and sent back out to fight in World War II. To the rear of the ship, this large circular structure, and behind that you would find the same structure. Turrets three and four were taken off and used right here on Oahu as shore defenses. Now one very popular question that we get is about something they did not salvage from this ship, the oil. The oil that you see on the water and that you can every once in a while smell in the air is in fact still coming up from this ship. On a daily basis we estimate about one and a half to two quarts of oil. Now, this always brings about the very popular question, why didn't they remove it then? Why don't we remove it now? Now to answer that question we go back to the salvage effort. When they began to salvage from this ship everything was prioritized. When this ship was sunk and that oil was contaminated with salt water, it would take the lowest possible priority of anything to be removed from this ship. It was useless basically. But then also in the salvage effort, as I mentioned before, the ship becomes entombed to over 950 men. When it becomes entombed to those men, they stop removing anything else from this ship, and they leave it exactly the way that it was. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why that oil is still out there today. For us to remove that oil today would mean to disturb or alter this ship in some way, but we are not going to do that. We're going to allow a very small amount of oil, what we estimate about one and a half to two quarts of oil, to continue to flow from this ship to maintain the sanctity of what this ship is, what it represents for the men who are still on board. Now, speaking of the men still on board, you may have noticed that the number of men on board this ship continues to grow. You may have seen in the Shrine Room the panel with names and dates that begins in 1982 and now runs through 2012. I will explain what this is and how that number continues to grow in just a moment. But as your return boat is pulling in, folks, what I'm going to ask you to do for me now is just shift to this right-hand side of the memorial. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, in the front, I do need you all to line up to the right-hand side, please. Oh, that's a good idea. I can smell that all Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
And ladies and gentlemen, so again, I do need you on that right hand side. And if you'd like to kind of come down a little bit more, that's fine. So we'll be able to hear just a little better. So if you want to continue to move towards the front end, folks, go ahead. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So as I was saying, folks, the number of men on board this ship continues to grow. Uh, very tragic, a very well known story for us of course, is that the 1,177 men were lost on board. that air?
Every morning Sherry gets up and walks the beach. She really likes to get up and walk in the morning. She's down here walking on the beach this morning. Sherry's out. Checking out the crawdads. Sherry, I said it was Sherry. I caught her way up here. She was down there. I said she's walking on the beach. Every day she's walking on the beach. Duke's restaurant. Duke's restaurant where we eat. Beautiful garden. Cloud hanging over the mountain. Oh, what was that? Looks like a bee. Good morning. Here we are, Thursday morning in Kauai, staying at the Marriott on Hului. How do you pronounce that? L A U. Lahui. 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 Thank you. And there's Sherry walking on the beach. I'm not doing too good because I just got up. We were yesterday all day at. Pearl Harbor, seven hours. There's a lot to see, and we didn't even see it all. So this morning we slept in. Here we are, about seven o'clock, watching our daughter walk on the beach. What did we do Tuesday? We went raft. Oh, yes. Tubing. We went tubing. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> that was fun. There's Sherry. 
she loves the ocean. We've had a great time. Monday Every, we went to Kmart. <laughs> Bob had to get some tennis shoes and sandals. Oh, I think she's talking on the phone. I think she is. All right, look at that beautiful. Did you point towards the ocean? Yes. Today we're taking a tour up the coast. We haven't been up the coast yet. Every day we've been busy. Lots to see here. Can't take it all in in a week. We're just going to have to come back. Did you get the guys out? They keep this pretty place pretty clean around here. There's a guy down here cleaning up. Sweeping up. Margaret's in making coffee and getting breakfast. Watch it. Just stand back. I've got yellow on. That is really cool. Cruise ship coming right into our harbor. Look at that thing. That tug went out after him. That is so cool. Knock on the door and tell Becky. No, I don't want to just her. Oh, I don't want to get this her. Pride of America cruise ship. Yeah, that's a beautiful shot. We now have a system in which we have the opportunity to start bringing down costs as opposed to just Your leaving five. millions of people out in the cold. Your five seconds went away a long time ago. <laughs> All right, Governor, Governor, tell, tell, the, tell the president directly why you think what he just said is wrong about Obama. Well, I did with my first statement, but I'll go on. Please uh, elaborate. I'll, I'll elaborate. <laughs> exactly right. Um, first of all, I like the way we did it in Massachusetts. I, I like the fact that in my state we had Republicans and Democrats come together and work together.
what you did instead was